Good evening in Japan. Good morning in Germany and hello worldwide. And a very warm welcome to the virtual panel discussion on Femtech empowerment through innovation, which is jointly organized by the Japanese German Center Berlin, the JDZB, and the German Center for Research, Innovation, and Innovation Tokyo, the DWIH Tokyo. Thank you all very much for joining us today. My name is Phoebe Stella Holtgrün, Head of Conferences and Project Management at the Japanese German Center Berlin, and it is my honor to serve as your MC today. Please let me give some organizational reminders for the audience. This panel discussion is completely held in English language, but a simultaneous interpretation into Japanese language is available. If you wish to hear the Japanese interpretation, please select the interpretation mode on your bottom toolbar and please select Japanese. Then an explanation of how to use the tool for interpretation can also be found in the manual for participants sent to you upon registration. And I briefly explain this in Japanese as well. Those who would like to use simultaneous translation function, please click on the growth at the bottom of the screen that says interpretation and click the language of your choice. For details, please look at the manuals for web conference participation and we would provide information as to how to use the interpretation function in chat as well. Today, the audience is muted and your camera is disabled until the QA part. Please feel encouraged to use the chat box for questions and comments, preferably in English language. In the last part of the discussion, you will also be able to raise your hand and ask questions. Please wait until the chair addresses you and then turn on your video and microphone. You can ask your question or in English or in Japanese language. The event will be recorded and published on YouTube afterwards. Please note that you or your name might appear if you use the chat or video function. After the panel discussion and starting at 6.30 p.m. Japan Standard Time and 10.30 a.m. Central European Time, respectively, you have the option to participate in informal networking and breakout rooms. Thank you. And now we start with the program. And first of all, I would like to kindly ask the Secretary General of the Japanese German Center Berlin, Dr. Julia Münch, to welcome you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Dear Ms. Manke, dear panelists from Japan and Germany, last but not least, dear participants from all over the world, it is my great pleasure to welcome you today to our virtual panel discussion jointly organized by the German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo and the Japanese German Center Berlin. Our two organizations share the strong opinion that we can go very far if our two countries join forces, and this applies to business, to science, to politics, art, culture, and many, many more aspects of society. The Japanese German Center Berlin, which I have been representing for about one and a half years now, uh, serves therefore as a platform for all of those who contribute to fostering our bilateral and international relations as well as to everyone interested in learning from the respective other countries. So we offer numerous networking opportunities in the analog world, as well as in digital space. And our activities range from cultural events, exchange programs and courses to panel discussions and symposia. We are always trying to pick topics which are of mutual interest for both countries and have a potential for collaboration and growth. So when together with our cooperation partner, DWI, IH, <laughs> I practiced that, but it's difficult. We started to conceptualize today's event quite a while ago. Our initial idea was uh, a conference focusing on the relationship between diversity and innovation. From there, it was only a short way to come across Femtech, which we then chose as our topic today. 
The term femtech is short for female technology. Probably everyone has uh, researched that by now. And it refers to tech products addressing needs that especially women have. It was coined in 2016 by the Danish entrepreneur Ida Tin as a way to drive investment and innovation in the female health technology market. With half the world's population or more than 4 billion potential consumers, female health is a promising market that has developed rapidly in recent years. Possible approaches to the topics are manifold. One of them, for example, which I find particularly interesting is the field of gendered medicine. For example, I learned that women suffering heart attacks show different symptoms than men, which means that female heart attacks are sometimes not recognized by doctors right away as medical research used to ignore such differences in symptoms. And this neglect may be largely due to the fact that 20, 30 years back, the medical profession was predominantly male and that medical testing groups were also primarily, primarily male, which might be true to a certain extent even today. On the other hand, by the way, we have learned that elderly people are also not well rep represented in medical testing. And this is um, also sometimes a problem in dosing medications. And I think that these are in fact very good examples why diversity is so important. We are very happy that several scientists, but also founders and CEOs have taken the time to join our discussion today. I'm very curious about their experiences, visions, and also obstacles that they have encountered and overcome in science, as well as in business. One of the obstacles may be a shortage of skilled labor, which in fact is a growing problem for many industries. One part of the panel discussion will therefore address the question why the proportion of women in technical jobs is still low, although generally higher salaries are offered than in the social sector. Another obstacle could be to receive venture capital, which is generally spoken a challenge for startups in Germany, as well as in Japan, certainly more than in the US, but maybe all the more when it comes to products dealing with female health. I am personally especially interested to learn about the different approaches of Japan and Germany in this field with the expectation that we can certainly learn from each other. What would make me especially happy would be if this event could also be a kickoff for further collaboration. Before I conclude my remarks, I would like to express our thanks to a number of people who made today's panel discussion possible. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Blaken and the entire team of German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo for their creative ideas, the smooth cooperation, and uh, last but not least, the funding of today's event. Let me also thank all distinguished panelists for taking their precious time and sharing their knowledge with us. And uh, of course, I want to thank everyone for their participation. Please enjoy. Let's continue to empower each other. And I hand over to Dorothea Manke in Tokyo. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to announce Dorothea Manke, Director of the German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo, and to ask for her words of welcome. Tokyo, um, hello to the world and hello to Germany, dear um, speakers, dear participants. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the DWIH, and I know it's hard to speak, um, to this panel discussion on Femtech. It's wonderful to see uh, this great uh, interest um, in this event and uh, your great participation. Thank you very much for coming here today. So as Dr. Münch pointed out, Femtech is a relatively young concept for services and products improving women's health and well-being. In other words, Femtech products are addressing the female body specifically, which is a refreshing dynamic in industry as well as in research, where the claim for gender neutrality often led, leads to the human default remaining male. So on a practical level, femtech is breaking with taboos. We are living in a world where, for example, menstruation 
is still stigmatized to the extent that girls in some countries are ashamed to go to school when they are on their period. Even in countries like Germany and Japan, we rarely discuss about these topics like menopause or menstrual pain in public. We do, do so personally, and even if we do so, um, everybody is a little bit embarrassed to speak about these topics. So the femtech sector sheds lights on these issues, puts them out in the public and for discussion and seeks practical solution. However, it's not only stigmatization that disadvantages women, it's also ignorance. In most cases, the male default is not set maliciously, but due to a lack of information and perspective. Ignorance about women's specific symptoms of heart disease has led female patients underdiagnosed. As researchers of gendered innovation point out, gender plays a role in many fields. Male crash dummies and virtual existence reproducing female stereotypes are just some examples. Of course, this also relates to female representation. As long as women are underrepresented in politics, industry, and science, the lack of female perspective will remain. This being said, we have to keep in mind that gender categories like men and women, female and, female and male, can never represent all people and all their diversity. The problem of Stigmatization, ignorance, and misrepresentation apply to women as well as to LGTB community and get even more complex when inter interrelated with ethnic groups. So please allow me to say a few words about the DWIH Tokyo. Now I also get confused about my own organization. So the DWIH. Tokyo, the German Center for Research and Innovation, or in German, the Deutsche, Deutsches Wissenschaft und Innovationshaus, Tokyo, was founded by the German Foreign Office. And we are provide, providing a platform for German research and innovation in Japan. We are holding many events throughout the year, such as this today, and we uh, want to connect experts and stakeholders from Germany and Japan with the um, general public. And I would like to invite all of you to connect with us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or to register for our newsletter. So dear colleagues from the Japanese German Center Berlin, thank you very much for this wonderful collaboration in organizing this event this time and also in the past. It's always a pleasure to work with, together with you and dear distinguished speakers. Thank you so much for making time and for sharing your insights with us. And I'm looking very much forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothea. And now I have the pleasure to hand over the word to Dr. Laura Blicken, Deputy Director of the DAD Regional Office Tokyo and Program Manager of the German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo, DWIH Tokyo, who will kindly chair the panel discussion. Laura, please. Thank you very much, Phoebe. So as we just heard in the greeting words, the term Femtech was actually just coined eight years ago in 2016. But last year in 2021, analysts already counted more than 1,300 Femtech companies worldwide. More than half of these 1,300 companies are located in the US. Europe has the second largest share with about 24% and Asia is home to only 14% of the Femtech companies. However, there is um, tremendous potential seen for future growth, especially in Asia. On the other hand, there are also a lot of bottlenecks we have already heard about. One is about investment. This also is due to the reason that still until now, more than 90% of venture capital decision makers are male, and therefore they do not necessarily have an open ear for women's needs. Another bottleneck lies in the research. Only 4% of the capital for research and development in healthcare is directed at women's health right now. And this might even keep the future growth of the femtech sector down. At the same time, the low percentage also points at another problem of women's representation in research. And this is why today we would like to discuss how femtech relates to women's empowerment. Therefore, it is my great honor to welcome five amazing speakers from various backgrounds to the panel. 
We have assembled femtech founders as well as expert from, experts from gendered innovation and female career development. So first, from the side of gendered innovations and women in STEM, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Miyoko Owatanabe. Miyoko is Executive Director at the Japan Science and Technology Agency, or JST in short. At JST, she currently leads the Office for Diversity and Inclusiveness as Director. Before joining JST in 2013, she worked at Toshiba for many years, during which she also went to Canada and the UK. She is a member of the Science Council of Japan, where, after serving as Vice President, she is now the Chair of the Committee on Gender-Based Innovation. She was the Chair of Science Agora in 2015 and 2016, and of the first Gender Summit in Tokyo in 2017. Miyoko, thank you so much for joining us today. Next, I would like to introduce our experts on the German side. Professor Dr. Nicola Marsden is Professor of Social Informatics at Heilbronn University of Applied Sciences in Germany. She has extensive experience in the tech industry, and her research focuses on the co-creation of gender and IT in the design process and in the design of technology. She is also Vice Chair at the Competence Center Technology, Diversity, Equal Opportunities in Germany. Just this year, she has published a book together with Karen Holzblatt on the topic of retaining women in tech. This book offers principles for redesigning processes to help women thrive in tech teams. Nicola, thank you very much for making time to be with us today. Our next speaker is from the field of medicine. Dr. Karina Forisek is doctor certified in Germany as well as in the United States. Following her interests in women's and digital health, She's currently doing a fellowship in medical informatics at the core facility Digital Medicine and Interoperability at the Berlin Institute of Health at Charité. She completed her PhD thesis at Boston Children's Hospital, had clinical rotations at Harvard Medical School, and was working clinically in obstetrics, gynecology, and general medicine in Germany. Karina, thank you very much for joining our panel today. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce two founders of femtech companies in Germany and in Japan. Dr. Amina Sugimoto launched the startup Fermata in 2019. Today, Fermata provides a marketplace for a wide range of curated femtech products and services. Headquartered in Japan, Fermata also has a branch office in Singapore. Amina was born in Asia, raised in Africa and educated in Europe. She actually did her bachelor program at Jacobs University Bremen in Germany. She obtained a Doctor of Public Health degree at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Before launching her own startup, she joined the social impact focused venture capital Missetol Fund as healthcare innovation producer and specialized in health policy, pharmaceutical affairs and health tech startup support. Amina, thank you very much for joining our panel. And finally, it is my great pleasure to introduce Peggy Reichelt. Peggy founded X by X Women in Balance in 2019, supporting midlife women in their journey through menopause and aging healthy. X by X offers video and audio programs that help women understand their bodies and the impact of nutrition and lifestyle changes. It also offers scientifically formulated plant-based supplements developed with medical experts, experts specifically for women over 40 to soothe physical and emotional realities of menopause. Peggy is an experienced entrepreneur and passionate digital female health and nutrition expert. She start, started her own, uh, she started her first company in 2004, wrote two books and is a licensed food coach. Peggy, thank you very much for joining us today. Right, so now um, before we start the discussion, as we have assembled speakers from so many diverse and various backgrounds today, I would like to take a look at each of your fields separately first. And as, as our topic today is femtech, I would like to dive right into that. We have heard a lot of statistics about femtech now, but I would be interested in your personal experiences. What has actually motivated you to, to found your femtech companies? Peggy, maybe can we start with you? Why did you found X by X Women in Balance? 
Sure. Thank you for the word. And I'm, I'm really happy about this panel because I think femtech and female empowerment is still like a very underserved um, market. So my, my motivation was actually very, very personal. Um, I was very interested in the fact, how can I personally age healthy? So I'm turning I'm 47 in a couple of days. And uh, I had my grandma, she was suffering from Alzheimer's. And you know, I was thinking like, how can like a woman arrive in her 80s, 90s without boundaries, being like independent, physically, mentally fit? And um, how is this going to happen? And when you look into this, um, how we age, then you suddenly at some point in a woman's life, you stumble about menopause, which basically happens in the middle of life. And um, that was the start of my journey, because, you know, the more I looked into it, the bigger it became and the more implication it had. And it was kind of like a a window for female health, this like midlife um, phase. And that's what my motivation was. And I still love it. And it's it's so interesting field because there are so many new things coming up. We still know so little about the female body and um, the microbiome and all those things related. So it's it's super interesting. Yes, thank you very much. Um, maybe I can ask you about the funding process itself. Um, were there a lot of challenges for you? We have heard about the challenge of finding investment. How yeah. did that play out for you? Well, um, I was lucky because I had two companies before. So I had a little bit of financial background and I was like, I really want to set up the company the way I want it. And I don't want to have anybody a saying in it. So I uh, self-founded it um, and my co-founder as well. So we were two when we started. And it was interesting because we started, of course, like in our little bit, uh, in our little ecosystem here in Berlin, um, also with investors and with other entrepreneurs. And the funny thing was that everybody was like, menopause, but I mean, that's such a niche market. And I was like, wow, this is not a niche market. It's like, basically women like spend almost like one third of their life in menopause because it starts like when we are in our forties. And since we are like, on average turning 84 it's it's a huge part of a woman's lifespan so it's not a niche market at all and menopause is like yes it's like the, the, the main phase of the symptoms is between 40 and 60 but it affects like as i said before the aging process so it's not a niche market and women are not a niche market because like it's 50 percent of the population and every woman is going through menopause so it's not it's not a disease or anything it's just like a very normal process of life and it was interesting to convince those people but you know once you explain it a little bit they all clicked and even like the males they were like oh wow that's interesting um because they understand but i think it's it's like with a lot of things that we have in the world it's about education about knowledge and once we know we better understand so um yeah so self-funded in the beginning and um it, Actually, we had a lot of people asking to join as investors. And in the beginning, we just really refused it because we were like, no, we want to do it our way. So I didn't really have this, um, this problem to find funding. Um, but I think it's also like whether you're experienced and you have your network. So I think the network is, is a pretty big part. So um, if you're new to the field and you haven't founded a company before, you don't have a track record, then it's certainly even more difficult for women and certainly more difficult in niche markets um, like femtech. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let me pick up the word network because I think that's also very important for, for Fermata, Amina. Um, but before we, um, we talk about that, could you tell us about your personal reasons why you started your startup uh, Fermata? What led you to found yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting um, because our work now focuses on women's health, femtech. People kind of assume that my primary focus was on like motivation was around women's health. But initially when I first started it, my interest was not on women's empowerment or women's health. I mean, obviously I was interested, mm -hmm. but the start wasn't there. And as you introduced, you know, thanks for your introduction. As I grew up in Africa and my dad is from Malaysia, I have experienced growing up in um, low middle income countries and access to medicine is one of the biggest issue there. And if you look at the, the world uh, today with COVID, when there is a clear needs of vaccine, you know, pharmaceutical company puts in thousands or thousands of millions of dollars to come up with the vaccine. Whereas when there is a, um, you know, like male sexual wellness, women's health, like LGBTQ issues, or like even red cancers for kids, these are areas that there's definite de demand, but because one, it might be taboo in certain countries or cultures or numbers, you know, the patient number is little that, 
the market is not yet established. There's a potential, mm -hmm. but not yet. So I was interested in that. And, you know, and so for us, I'm currently working on women's health, but um, our vision is turning uh, taboo into crimes. So pretty much looking into, interested in creating a market in within healthcare. And within healthcare, a certain uh, market that has long been taboo. So there was, the market wasn't established, but with a, with, with Formata's activity, we're hoping to sort of um, establish a market. And then the Femtech was a good start. Does that make I sense? See. Yes. And were there challenges for you for to find investment, for example, to find venture capital? I guess, um, I mean, the answer is no. And I think simply because I worked at a venture capital before and had connections and I know so, yeah. <laughs> and I knew what they were looking for, how to tell the story. And if I haven't done that, that experience or connection, uh, learn about where, what sort of answer they want when I pitch, I think would have been quite difficult. I see. Wow. I think you have a lot of contact to other companies in the femtech sector as well, because you are the marketplace to actually um, sell these sell these products. Um, from your experience, do you think uh, the investment is a challenge in Japan actually for the other companies and the other startups? I think two, three years ago, yes, but now, I mean, the femtech industry is on a bloom. So like, I think yeah. VCs wants to uh, invest. But I think one of the challenges for venture capital is that they have capital they're interested, but they can't do due diligence. It's really difficult for them to sort of pick on a good femtech startup. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's what the challenge that they're facing right now. But it's not like they're not willing to, they're willing to, but they just don't know how. I see. Okay, that's that's very interesting. So you also actually experienced this femtech boom we have seen in the numbers. You see it in Japan as well. You experienced so when it. I, yeah. When we first brought femtech term to Japan, it was nine, 2019. We hosted one of the, we, we hosted an exhibition collecting about 30, 40 femtech products from around the world. And I think that was one of the very first events, public event that we used the term femtech in Japan. And and, and, and around the time I actually went to the government and a minister of health and asked them like, hey, we want to bring in these products, but there are pharmaceutical affair law that actually we cannot product, I mean, sell and market these products. And at the time, their reaction was, oh, again, you know what Peggy said, it's actually a niche market. And I was like, how is it a niche? But it's, I mean, I kind of understand why they responded that way, because they want to really show what Femtech was. But now with the bloom, I mean, interest from the VC sector, from the you know, user sector, uh, private sector started to, to jump in. There's a growing interest among sort of IPO big companies to start one Femtech uh, project on their own and also implement Femtech services and product at their companies. So mm -hmm. I think that kind of pushed government to really look at the existing laws and so with, a, with, with all that, I think there is going to be a huge potential in Japan. Yes, very nice. That's very encouraging, I think, also for our other entrepreneurs in the sector. Um, Peggy, what about Germany? Do you experience a boom in fanpack right now? Yeah, I pretty much can uh, agree with what Amina said because I think it's very, very similar. First of all, there is a lot of money. Um, I mean, I don't know how the current um, developments in Europe, like Ukraine, et cetera, influencing those developments, but there has been really a huge influx of money. So um, there there was like, if you have a good pitch and you know how to address the market, I think I, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's, if you go there, you're confident, you know your market, you know your numbers, you get the money. So um, basically it's, um, and if you have experience and context, it's even better. Um, so the, the femtech market in Germany, basically you mentioned Ida, so her company Clue is also based, uh, she, she is from, from the Northerns, uh, but she founded her company in, in Germany. So the early years were very much focused on reproductive femtech, so everything concerned to puberty, fertility, um, pregnancy, because that's, and that's the, I think the, the general thinking, it was like, oh, that's the biggest market, you know, because a lot of women are pregnant, maybe once or twice, so they did the numbers. And um, now I see a rise of really underrepresented markets. Um, there are coming like specific, um, really like more niche markets. So um, companies addressing uh, antimaterioses, PCOS, um, genealogical um, uh, issues, um, contraception, 
Um, so it's going more and more beyond this pure reproductive um, phase of a woman. So um, in menopause, I think we're still like the only one in Germany. I mean, of course, there are other menopause products and obviously there's HRT and all the medical solutions, but I'm not aware of a company that's really like addressing like the information markets and like uh, the knowledge about menopause. And it's what uh, like it's in the core of our thing. So everything that comes to older women senior citizen which are not senior because we're in our 40s and 50s and so this second half of life is still underserved i would say from my point of view i see thank you very much so we have heard that there is a huge demand obviously um in the femtech sector in in germany and japan and um it is also said that femtech and that femtech um I can actually um, answer to this lack of female perspective in the health sector. And this is um, where I would like to ask Karina uh, for her opinion. Um, Karina, we have said that um, women have been overlooked uh, in the health sector in the past. Why has that been? Why have women been underdiagnosed with heart disease? Could you share yeah. your insights? Well, I think just like uh, many reasons, it's like only one reason, but I think one major reason is like that um, medicine used to be like this very male dominated field. And even nowadays, I mean, I can only say numbers for Germany, but for example, medical school, like half are female, the other half is male. But then if we look into the leading positions, it's like only 10% are female. And then, of course, like who puts in the research projects, like who's asking the research questions, who's going to committees, you know, who give out the money for funding. That's all the leading position. So it's like still mostly men. And um, I was working in OBGYN. And if you look like at those developments and achievements, and then you go into a field of urology, you know, like it's like so different. And um, I also used to um, be in pediatric cardiac surgery before, which was like a male dominated field. So um, there was like all males and then you go into OBGYN and there's like a lot of women, but they're all like residents. And then, you know, if you're at a conference, like just like mostly male, um, like speakers and there's a change right now, you know, that people mm -hmm. try to invite half women, half male, but still just like this uh, bias. And then, of course, uh, we have like mostly male data, like in clinical trials. I think they started in 1993 to allow women even to go into clinical trials, even, even nowadays. Like it's like mostly male um, participants in clinical trials. We also have like mostly male data. And just now we're trying to ask these questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh let us talk about that a bit, um, because it has been pointed out for some time now that um, we need data about women and that, and that women have to participate in the mm -hmm. medical trials. Is, isn't it change in the past? Don't you see a major movement well, there? Yeah, you could think, but then the study came out, which was like very interesting. They looked at um, all COVID uh, studies that were registered in clinicaltrials.gov, so clinical trials on COVID-19. And they found that like uh, only 18% of the studies looked into like gender differences in their analysis. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's like, like the most recent um, disease, like the whole world was engaged in and still like only 18%. So I would say the awareness is, uh, you know, raising up now, um, but it's still not there yet. Yeah, we're still mm -hmm. lacking the data. I see. And I read a lot about gendered medicine in recent years. So um, how much is that actually applied um, at the universities today? If you, if you learn, uh, yeah, if, if you are at university and you learn about your patients, do you actually take this gendered perspective and think about gender? Do you learn about that? Or would you say that's still a um, long way? Like it's, it's still not in the education schedule for mm -hmm. medical doctors. And, but that's where we really have to get into. That's why like even the awareness is like so important um, also through Femtech, um, you know, so that um, we're starting at the very base, like at the medical students so that they even know there's like a difference because like most medical students wouldn't even know that. 
and let, let alone like the doctors that are like practicing right now. And I think you're very lucky as a patient if you have a doctor who, who's like, oh, ibuprofen, you know, maybe we should check like if there's a difference between uh, men and women, how do they re react uh, on this medication? And um, yeah, and then of course, there's, you have to do a lot of reading as a doctor because like this is not provided in a general information. So definitely we have to um, um, give all this knowledge to students, but all kind of experts, like on the higher levels, like from not only research doctors, but also from the industry too. Yeah, so I think we're more at this awareness level right now. I see. Um, let us also take a look at the digital health sector, because I think that's also your field of expertise. Um, are there any recent developments uh, looking at female representation in the digital health sector? Yeah, so um, I mean, like, um, so my department, we're really looking into like how fair is data and um, because like um, with all this data we're gathering right now through wearables or the digital innovation. Um, we can develop like a lot of artificial intelligence. We're training algorithms based on the data, um, but we can only train the algorithms as good as the data is. So if we have a bias in this data, let's say only um, white men, um, then of course this algorithm will like maybe only get to find the symptoms of like white men, let's say. And so here also like there's like studies investigating like what kind of data are people dealing with? But the problem is like that um, the availability of data still. So I would say in Germany, we're building right now an infrastructure to gather like a lot of data, but the data is still biased. Um, so for example, um, there's still like a lot of data from white men from the US army because that's just the data you can get easily, mm -hmm. but really to get a diverse data pool, that's still very hard. Yeah, very difficult. And yeah. maybe this is something where Femtech could help, but let us discuss about that uh, in a minute. Uh, before that, I would like to take a little more broader perspective. And we have talked about medicine now, but um, if we look at innovation in general, um, are there innovation fields other than medicine and healthcare um, where a lack of female perspective is still creating biases? Miyoko, maybe may I direct this question at you? Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to tell you about the problem in engineering. The machine translation is a typical engineering when we're getting more popular in our life. Maybe many of you are using a tra uh, Google uh, translation. I tell you an exa example of a Google translation that is very popular. I tried from Japanese to English. The Japanese sentence means Watanabe-san is a director. The translated sentence in English was, Mr. Watanabe is a director. This is about me. I'm not Mr. Watanabe. Another mm -hmm. example is more strange. The Japanese sentence means Watanabe-san is a woman. The translated English was, Mr. Watanabe is a woman. Why is such a translation done? This is a clearly common problem in the world. This is based on most of AI engineers are men and most of directors in the society are men. Or they don't have perspective for everybody, including women. So next, let me tell you the change of a female ratio of researchers in Japan. Every year, it has increased, but the problem is the speed. It is very slow in Japan. The ratio increased 7% in 20 years. It takes more 35 years to achieve 30% 30, 30 if the speed is kept. So one of the problem is gender equality is to be slow. And when we look at the female ratio in research field, it is clear. The female ratio is very few in natural science and engineering. The female ratio in engineering is just 7%. The second problem in Japan is female ratio is 
too small, especially in engineering. So machine translation problem, I should trust, is just this problem. Mm. I see. Yeah, I think we have already touched a very complex issue there because um, it's not only about the data, it's also about mm -hmm. representation of women. Um, Nicola, um, could you comment on that um, about the bias uh, in innovation in general? <laughs> Yes, I'd be happy to. So, of course, um, we were when we're looking at these examples. Of course, they are created in a world, and um, Yoko has already said that who creates them. You know, it's like a kind of a vicious circle here. We're putting out these products that then are out in the world and do something. And so if we're, if we're looking, for example, there's the, the Apple Health app, for example, that came out in 2014. That's a real prominent example and claimed this allows you to track all relevant physical um, things going on in your body and everything. You know, when it first came out, there was no cycle monitoring in there. There just wasn't, you know, so that shows you this male default that's already been mentioned several times. And um, there's, there's many, many examples like that. And of course, they once again influence the world if the um, credit card um, algorithms actually disadvantage women, for example. If we are looking at um, VR that's created in a way that it continues to make women uh, more sick than men, and then they can participate, for example. If we're looking at um, video conferencing software, where we know that the frequencies that get um, transported um, in, in the voices are actually, um, actually it transports male voices better than female voices, you know? So they seem less com um, competent, which of course then reinforces the stereotypes that we already have, right? So it's this um, vicious circle going on also in the digital platforms, if you're looking at that, where um, women get rated worse and therefore or get less um, get less work if we're looking at um, freelance marketplaces or something like that. So this is all a, a vicious circle that we're that we have where um, we have the products, and they then influence, of course, also the people that go into this field. Right. Yes. So if we're looking at um, the people that go into the field, we've already heard about the, the numbers there and the numbers are um, similar in Germany. You know, we have um, like 20 percent um, about women in, um, in IT and software engineering. The number um, from the 80s actually has been going down at some point, you know, and, and now it's going up again. But um, it's really a point where we should look at what is happening inside the organizations to you know what's yeah. what's happening there yeah let, let's stick to that topic um nicola you have just published this book about um, retaining women in tech um i'm very curious to hear about your insights could you share with us some reasons why women are actually leaving the tech tech jobs Right. So, so in, in our uh, work, we looked at like the key factors that help women thrive in tech um, and um, develop this framework that gives you like an insight in what is going on there. And we identified the things that women need um, to be to thrive and to be successful and to want to stay. And big surprise or not, of course, these factors aren't different from what men need. But the specific situation in tech um, actually um, creates a situation where women do not have the same the same situation, you know, so because of gender stereotypes, because of the numbers. So the factors are, for example, a dynamic valuing team, having a, mm -hmm. a sense of belonging, having a cohesive team, a positive team experience. And of course, this is influenced by the team setup and by who's there and how you are addressed. 
Um, another thing is stimulating work. You know, if women go into tech, they would like to do tech work a lot of times, you know, maybe even most of the time, and they don't want to be promoted into project management or some other field. And what we find is that women get different work. They get what's called office housework a lot more times. You know, they're expected to do like the meeting minutes, you know, or take care of this and that and everything. Um, then we have like, we call that the push and support. You know, we see that a lot of times now uh, women are pushed out there in terms of, okay, here, you have been um, in the States at all these fancy hospitals. So you go out and take care of this. And then they get thrown out there, but they don't get support, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're left out in the open. And once again, it's important to realize that they're confronted with totally different things than from what men are. You know, that this, the, there's the like prove it again bias, having to prove your competence over and over again in every situation you go into. Um, the, the next thing would be like role models. There's, there's not as many role models. This also creates a different situation. And what we found what's especially important is it's not enough to have like one woman at the very top of the, of the company, of a tech company. You know, she runs the tech company and she's got her life in order and she's also got children and she's taken, um, she's, she's probably giving like um, self-consciousness classes and writing a children's book on the side. You know the whole package so this is very admirable but what people need of course is somebody around them that they can look to and say okay this person is living a life that I would like to lead you know that mm. seems attractive to me I can imagine um, being in that situation would be helpful I see. so I think we have uh, already a lot of reasons um, and a lot of uh, things that need to be changed in the tech sector for women um, to thrive there. Miyoko, um, I think there may be a lot of similarities in Japan too. You have been working at a tech company for many, many years. Could you comment on the reasons um, and, and the factors Nicola just pointed out? Do you have to add something? Why is it difficult for women in tech in Japan right now? Oh yeah, the situation is very similar in Japan. Uh, the role model program and uh, uh, young girls would like to uh, see the very near uh, young girls rather than the top level uh, women's uh, leader. And uh, let me explain the essential problem why Japanese gender equality is not progressed rapidly. The, this is a very essential problem. Uh, Japan, su Japan succeeded in economic growth from 1980 to mid of 1990. It was said Japan as number one. Most of our uh, labors were just men, and most of our women worked as full-time housewives. Mm -hmm. It was about 30 years ago, long time ago. It's not different from now, but the main male labors were around 30s and 40s at the time, and they are now 60s and 70s. They are top managers now in Japan. They think it was just Japanese success story and they believe mm. they can recover it again. Or they can not break away from their past successful experiences. This is the most serious problem in Japan, I think. In order to break away from the situation, we have to uh, show scientific evidence why gender equality and women's participation are needed now. Let me tell you gender analysis that is very clear in Japan. Promoting gender analysis is just key action of gendered innovations. We have a result of analysis of the economic value of the patents. The result shows that the value is 50% higher for the patent developed by mixed gender teams than male only teams. We can increase economic value without increase of budget only by increasing female researchers. Don't you think it is so powerful and very effective? Many management people and scientists can understand scientific evidence so that it is important to take data and show merit of women's participation 
that's scientific evidence, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that's very impressive data. I think that speaks for itself. So now um, I think we have taken a look at each of your fields separately and um, we have seen that the problems of ignorance about women's bodies, not only in medicine, but also in innovation in general, um, the ignorance about women is strongly connected also to women's uh, underrepresentation in this decision making. And now I would like to um, ask you how femtech can answer to this. What is the role of femtech against this backdrop? Um, Karina, maybe we can start again uh, in the medicine field. Do you think femtech can provide answers to the issues you just um, pointed out of data biases and underrepresentation in research? Mm, I think it's a, a bit early to really answer this, but I think there's definitely the potential. Um, and what Peggy Reichel said um, earlier, like that it's not only menstruation and pregnancy and fertility, but it's like going way beyond that. I think um, a good example would be the company Bloomer Tech. Um, they invented like a bra with uh, fabric sensors, which is like an electrocardiogram. So you can get like a lot of heart data on like women, which is lacking. We were talking about like uh, how heart attack is misdiagnosed in women even though like they suffer, like it's like one of the, the leading causes of death. So I think these are examples for the potential that if we go beyond this, like it's only um, menstruation <laughs> and pregnancy um, to really gather this data then, yeah. And also to um, really bring this awareness again to the people, like also from the industry. Yeah. yeah, I think that's two very important points, data and also the awareness part. Um, about the data, Peggy, I think at your company you are also doing a lot of research on menopause. Um, could, you, could you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. We have what we call like the X by X check. And it's basically, it's a little bit like a checkup that asks about lifestyle factors and also about a certain um, yeah, female health uh, points like menstruation and symptoms. And um, so far, 70,000 women have done the check. And last year in October, we, we analyzed the data and looked into it. And what we found out was that basically um, as this few research that is about the early phases of menopause because there is not a lot and it's like we discussed it before uh, for various reasons so we could see that um, when we looked at women starting at age like 35 until like 60 the symptoms of menopause change over the course which is um, an assumption that a lot of doctors also don't know about and like Karina said um, it's not part of the uh, of the education of the curriculum so um, looking at those data it kind of like confirms what women feel and it gives them knowledge and knowledge is power so once I know as a woman in my early 40s that those symptoms like lack of sleep um, mood swings depression um, low energy like reducing resilience are not because I'm crazy or I'm not capable of my life anymore but they're due to the fact that my hormones are starting to change then I know and I still feel the symptoms, but I'm empowered and I can do something about it. And this is like the power that data has and all the other things that we said, there's like um, data bias that we have when we develop technologies. If you use the wrong data and we, for example, in like, let's um, take my example of the menopause. If you assume that the average woman starts their menopause in their 50s, then the data assumption is wrong. And that's why like this phase perimenopause, the first phase was not known until maybe like 10 years ago so it was like there was research a lot of research done in Canada looking at earlier um, stages and how do those women feel and it's funny because I was reading about like why, why is that the case of course you know research is expensive so you take the assumption and say like you know let's start with a woman around 50 because this is like when the period stops so obviously that's the point when menopause starts um, because including those women that are maybe 40 or 35 makes studies much more expensive. So, um, yeah, and maybe, you know, women are not so important and it's just like all in their head, you know, this depression and stuff. So it's a whole, there are so many courses and they lead to this falsification of data and like at the end effect, like to, to wrong treatments. And so we're really happy to, to use those data and use them as a basis for education and like where can we basically um, step on it and, and how can we help those women to feel normal and know like what's really happening with their bodies yeah so you're actually closely collaborating with the side of science as well 
the data you are you are getting through your um, through your questionnaires and so on, you're actually also sharing with scientists. Is that right? No, not yet. We use them basically internally to develop new programs. But um, uh, since Karina is in Berlin, we we definitely have to hook up for a coffee <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think that's that's really cool to to use it. And because we have such a we have a huge community of women, and it's it's there are not like some kind of like no name woman they are there and they're really happy to participate and we can see it especially because we use instagram a lot for 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 our education as well and women are so happy to participate because they know they feel lonely and they are really proud to be part of this development so i think taking the end user explain to them what's happening and and let them be part you know of the research and i think women are so, so strong collaborators i think that's a, that's a really opportunity there yeah wonderful um, Amina, if I may ask you, how would you think is uh, Femtech actually relating to the field of medicine? Are you providing new insights or is it more about awareness? Um, where do you see the role of Femtech? I guess the role or rather the power of Femtech is not just on data. I'm just I'm not going to talk about data because there's a plenty being talked about, but I think it's one of the first time in human history that a lot of physical products that basically sort of represents um, a specific issues that women go through in a lifetime. And I guess what's really important to clarify here is that femtech is 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 a, is a field that only not only but sort of focus on biologically defined women, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that how he or she uh, represent themselves within the society, but then those who were born as uh, as a with a female body. Now I guess when I first brought Femtech, uh, when I started doing exhibition, one of the first thing I found is that people can actually talk about, start, people can talk about their own personal issue when there is a physical product in front of you. Mm. For example, a menstrual cup, it's not a Femtech, it, there's no tech into it. But then having the product in front of them and even by discussing like, oh, how much do I bleed? And that amount that's, Maybe if I thought it was no more, that bleeding amount compared to my friend who just think, oh, I actually bleed more than that. So being able to compare, being able to discuss. And I think that's a part uh, of MTech. And, it's, and by having this product, then we can actually start having a conversation with those who uh, have, were not born with a female body. So like, like um, so like I usually bring this product to politicians, investors, and having this product in front of us actually allow us to have a conversation around and, and it, it no longer becomes a taboo topic. So yeah, I think it will, um, it will take time. So until we actually shift to the level where we can actually start to collect data, analyze data, get all the result from, um, from what actual vital data we can collect from Femtech, it's going to be it's going to take the next you know two three or five years time but i really hope that by then we no longer be using the term femtech anymore it will just become a part of health tech and that data will be generated but until then we have to use you know physical product uh within femtech sort of industry to sort of educate to be able to talk about these things um, create an environment where people don't feel shameful to talk about a taboo topic yeah. yes i don't know if i have answered your question but yeah yeah, no, that's very interesting because it's also a question I wanted to bring up. The term femtech it's, itself is a bit controversial. There has been critics that um, by labeling something as femtech, you're automatically saying all the other tech is, is male tech and you don't even have to name it because uh, femtech is a niche you have to label separately. Um, but you already elaborated on that a bit. You said um, right now maybe we need it, but in, in some years, uh, mm -hmm. It might not be necessary anymore. Uh, could could you explain a little bit more about that? Why is it important right now to have the term femtech? So I, th I think people just need something that they they can sort of, um, they'll feel, so, so sorry, going back. The term femtech, what's being used in Japan is a lot different from the West. And I think it's quite interesting. When I first brought femtech um, two years ago, in the beginning, younger sort of generations started to use the term using Instagram. And then mm -hmm. all these uh, fashion magazines started to pick it up. So it wasn't really like industry thing. And people started, because Japanese people 90% don't really speak English. So people started to use the term as more like a way to express 
that there is a need and you know um about their body or like menstruation fertility i feel i want to be able to talk about these things and rather like the voice of younger generation it became a movement and mm -hmm. it rather became a sort of a trend here in Japan. And nowadays, uh, every single mag fashion magazine probably have used the term femtech. Now, what actually defines femtech in the Western term in, in English is a lot different from what's being used here in Japan. Um, but I guess I guess that's sort of the, the trend here. And so- Could, could yeah. you explain about that a bit more, like on a concrete example? Could you think of a product that's um, labeled as femtech in Japan, but uh, not in Germany or in the US? So uh, period underwear and menstrual products, uh, um, uh, femcare products, for some reason, mm -hmm. those are now sort of considered uh, the femtech. I think it's the most, yeah, most famous example are these, these uh, underwears. Um, for period pens, yeah. And I guess a lot of the, the scientists, um, doctors, they all, I mean, I, I have some a doctor working in this field that claims that we need more evidence in women's health and in order for this interest to grow we have to, it has to be evidence-based the product has to be evidence I and mean, i do understand that and but at the same time i think it's important for this work to be recognized by um by the public so quite a lot of people know about the term femtech in japan in japan every year they list up um term like 10 different words that became most popular in the year and femtech was named one of them was nominated as one so i think it's a good start recognizing representing the, the the social issues under the term femtech and then because there's a tech side to it not just the uh, younger generation or like those who's into you know instagram i use but at the same time it's also attract capitalists and venture capitals and so in a way it's sort of in you be used there are two different definition now in japan but hopefully it will sort of emerge into one in the next couple of years, and then the term itself will will disappear in the next five years. <laughs> See, um, Nicola, maybe may I ask you from the background of of gendered innovations also, what do you think about the term femtech? Do you think um, it's good that we have it and that it's booming right now? How how you, would you see the role of of femtech as a movement right right now. well yeah right i think i mean i think it's good that we have it right now for for reasons that have been said i think of course it's also symptomatic for what's going on in tech that we have to have it you know that's that's the thing where where if if tech was really serving everybody then of course we wouldn't have to have this you know so that's from the from the tech side of it which also i think um we have to be aware that what what is labeled as femtech uh, wouldn't if you're looking at people who are looking at um uh, at gender and and feminist perspectives um wouldn't necessarily be something where you say okay this is something that serves uh, degendering or serves intersectional or serves everybody um, because for example if you take a, a cyclist mon cycle monitoring app you know that starts off by asking you are you trying to um, get pregnant or are you trying to prevent pre pregnancy then we have what we call configuring the user you're already making the user either be heterosexual or feel out of place you know and this is what what um, is a problem is when people feel like they're out of place and the tech does that to us this is what we're trying to prevent and femtech is not free of that so this is something i think we have to we have to watch out for um, but of course being having having a chance to have those needs served is extremely relevant and also if you're thinking at the creation side of it or at the design side of it um, then a lot of the problems that we have in tech is that um, there's a an attempt to kind of fix the women so they fit in you know or the entrepreneurs that if they would only present themselves like this then they could do that if they would only happen like this and you have to be more um, self-confident but you have to be a little more moderate otherwise you come across as aggressive you know that's this tightrope and an important part of gendered innovations is to say we're not fixing the women we're going to fix um, the numbers we're going to fix the institutions we're going to fix the knowledge or the data, you know, that we've already been talking about. And of course, it's also about fixing the, the culture, 
you know, and mm. there, of course, in, in femtech um, companies, um, there is a different culture, just for the simple fact, because I was saying, you know, men are assumed competent when it comes to, uh, to tech, you know, this is like the implicit bias. And of course, here we have a different situation, because in femtech, all of a sudden, women are assumed competent, because it's about women, you know, so this already really, really uh, changes something. And of course, the question is, how does that get into the community? How does that, um, how does that transfer? I have this um, memory of a tech conference I was at with a, you know, there's these poster sessions and then you stand there in front of your poster and people walk by and I was presenting a poster on um, biofeedback devices for incontinence for older women, you know, it was specifically older women and um, so I, I was standing there and people kind of walked by and you could just see these um, young men that came came closer and were interested and then they saw like um, intravaginal probes or something like that and then they kind of sat back and walked over to another poster you know so if you're looking at the the culture there both in the companies but also in um in the knowledge producing world and in academia um there's still a lot of uh, fixing to be done let's yeah. just say it that way Thank you very much. Yeah, um, it's uh, as a matter of fact, I think many of us expected that, but um, most of the founders in the femtech sector actually are women. I read statistics of about 70%, some, sometimes it's also said 90%, which is obviously quite a lot. Um, the standard is actually that uh, four and five founders are male in, in all other sectors. So yeah, that's a big difference. Miyoko, if I may ask you about the Japanese side, how would you think um, the tech culture in Japan will change due to femtech? Will there be more women representation? Yes, oh, thank you very much. So um, most of uh, engineering and the technologies are developed by male researchers and, en and engineers. Lack of a female perspective is clear. In order to change the situation, we need to incorporate female perspective and value most of women think into engineering and technology. So femtech is a typical technology to break through the present situation. So and femtech engineers and um, female engineers and female researchers should be femtech or innovators. It is necessary to remove our unconscious bias or that engineering and technology is a men's field. Or it is also important and it is also necessary to show um, young active women active in the engineering field and the uh, technology field to high school girls, teachers and parents. Senior women, including me, cannot be role models because the historical background are very different from young girls. So it is effective to introduce young women that they feel close to. Yes, thank you very much. So I think um, it's again the topic of role models that's very important here. And yeah, we are happy to have also two founders with us today who will play uh, great role models, I think. And um, on this note, I would like to take a closer look on um, what it actually takes to become a femtech innovator, because I think um, we have a lot of new startups um, coming on the market right now. And um, we would be interested in what kind of people are those uh, who are founding these um, startups? Peggy, could you, um, could you tell us about your colleagues? <laughs> What drives them, drives them? Um, well, about the founders, I would say, like in general, and I think there is no difference between femtech or prop tech or fintech or all the other areas. You need to be a little bit crazy and insane and a risk taker in a way, because um, when, when I, you know, I had this idea of like looking into the menopause space and the healthy aging space, I was so frustrated a lot of times. And I was like, a couple of times I was almost taking my laptop, throwing it against the wall because I felt like I had so many loose ends and there were so much, um, so many symptoms, so many different women. So, you know, it takes a lot to kind of like have the patience to go through that. And you, in the beginning, you don't know, you know, whether you're going to be successful, whether anyone, whether you're even on the right track, whether you have will have like 
you kind of like start with a hypothesis when you find a company, you don't know whether there actually is a need, a market. So you need to be a little bit a risk taker and a little bit crazy. And you need to be, in my opinion, um, passionate about what you do because this kind of like keeps you rolling. So um, I had a company, a different company before and it was a little bit more about tech and gaming. And honestly, I'm not a gamer, I'm not a techie by heart. So it was a lot of effort for me to stick, you know, to the topics. And now with this nutrition and health and sports, I, I love it. I could read, you know, about stuff 24 seven. So it that really makes a difference. And maybe, um, and I see it a lot in other founders, there's a strong passion about the topic that you're involved in, especially I see it more with women than with men, because men tend to sometimes be a little bit more opportunistic and just jump on something where there is a trend, you know, whether it's fintech or crumb tech or real estate, women go more for what they feel um, they kind of like serve society and, and it really are more passionate about it. And I see it uh, with the, um, we have a, we are an all female team. Uh, unfortunately, I think we have one video editor. He's a freelancer. It's our only male, so it's it's a little bit uh, sad. I would love to have more men on the team, um, but the the women and the girls that work for us, I think they're really truly passionate, no matter what age they are. So the younger ones, they see menopause happening with their mothers, and they're really like, oh my god, this is so interesting and they have such a strong power to educate. And, and I love that. And it gives me a lot of hope for this younger generation. Those girl, the girls are more bold and they just go out and take and try. And I think um, compared to my generation, at least, it's, it's, um, it's a huge advantage that I see there. Yes, thank you. We actually had a question in the chat um, concerning um, women who, who are actually would be able to found um, startups, but maybe um, they are just too cautious about it. Um, Clara Meyer has said that um, they did research and um, in the surveys, they found out that many women actually don't see themselves as experts. So what would you think is needed um, to influence the awareness of innovative women for their position and also for their role, for the, to be role models for other women as well? What do you think um, can help them? I think I could direct this question to all of you, but maybe Amina, could you could you answer to that? Um, I don't know if I have a specific answer to this question, but what I had in my mind when you answered that question, sorry, I had to read, read, read that question again, but um, when the femtech industry sort of started to, when people started to come up with the, you know, started to incorporate femtech products into, into uh, the, sorry, into the business, the very beginning was just men. Did you know that? In Japan as well, in the US, the first, um, very first close to IPO products, uh, companies and products are founded by men, mm -hmm. but it's slowly now shifted towards women. Now, yeah. it's an interesting market that is so new that even if you come up with a very innovative, very latest technology product, it's not going to sell. The people are not going to buy it. They just don't want because they don't know the need of their own body, right? They don't even know how to describe it. They don't even have access to all this information where they can get these products. And there's also a regulation at the government level that this product cannot be sold or marketed in the way that we want to market. So there's so many things to solve before a good product can get um, marketed on um, in the market. And I guess the situation may be similar in Germany. Now, so I want, what I want to say is that Maybe in this industry, Femtech, we don't really need innovators right now, but people who work in different industry or like different field to sort of like participate in. So those who work in a government level, policy level, media, or like, you know, um, to sort of get engaged, be a part of this industry new movement. So it's really important one to really figure out, do I really want to come up with my own product? All my strength doesn't really fall in that. And maybe I'm better off rewriting the policy at the government level. Or uh, if you're a lawyer, maybe you can help out some of the femtech companies to get the product on the market. So it's because it's still new, such a new uh, industry, there's so many parts to play. Uh, stakeholders not yet like sort of um, decided. So I guess I guess there are a lot of opportunities and one doesn't doesn't have to be engineers or scientists or um, innovator to be a part. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Miyoko, do you have something to add? How, how can we encourage young women to 
uh, actually gain the confidence to do something, be it uh, launching a startup, but also go into politics, just to come to a level of decision making. Yeah, uh, actually in Japan, uh, the young uh, women are very active and uh, they have a lot of uh, talent, uh, even for engineering and technology. But uh, generally speaking, Japanese women are humble, very humble. That is a problem. Mm -hmm. So even if they have a lot of idea and uh, they have a, a lot of uh, uh, many, many uh, things they would like to do, but uh, they don't tell about it. So uh, I would like to say young girls uh, become more ambitious. <laughs> and <laughs> what, uh, what, uh, please say, uh, what would uh, you'd like to do and you'd like to have an uh, idea? So that is a problem, I think, for Japanese women. I see. Thank you very much. Nicola, do you agree for the German side or do you have to add something? Uh, absolutely agree. I think um, what's what's important to to realize is we've already kind of said implicit bias, um, but I just want to once again stress what that means. Implicit bias means that it's not something that's out there and other people have it, but we all have it, right? So this is part of our well functioning in this society is that we have internalized this you know and then we can reflect and 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 think that we don't like it but um it's 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 there and it's in in all of us and of course if we're if we're looking at um okay women don't see themselves as experts and if we're looking at how do how do people get into it it's really important to look at early years education grade school education you know and and, and here there is um, there is so much um, going on there that reinforces these gendered stereotypes, you know, in the perception of teachers in seeing potential in children. Um, it's it's a well known um, phenomenon that um, girls are much more successful in in subjects, but the potential is seen in boys much more. Right. So this is. Um, this is something where where they then go into a situation where they build up the self-confidence and they can build up the self-confidence that um, pays off later on in life, you know, and, and girls get rewarded for being more careful and for questioning themselves more. And um, and here we really have to look at how can we how can we work with that and what can we do there and um, it it has to do with simple things like making sure programming and computational thinking is um, um, is integrated in the curricula of, of grade school of early years. It goes to um, to our um, value of early years education, um, grade school education, how we pay those teachers as opposed to others even, um, but also in terms of what actually is tech and what's not tech. You know, we've already kind of talked about this as if it's a an obvious um, opposite, but um, but if you look at it, it's really not. You know, it's a continuum, and um, what is um, what is deter or what is um, identified as tech is very much connected to what's identified as male, whereas what's um, non-tech um, is is um, correlates with our perception that something is female. You know, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's why in the in the education we're looking at making activities. We talk about computational thinking, and um, we're really trying to to see how can we um, get away from this dichotomy. So one important thing to realize is that if you're looking at um, learning how to program, we know that um, language capabilities are a much better predictor at um, programming skills than math is, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you think that true in terms of how competencies are gendered and how, how probably once again, implicit bias, most of us have in our head this connection between math and programming and male, you know, it's very hard to break these biases um, when I tell you this fact that actually languages and language competency predicts um, programming much better, you know, and that's a long process, but we have to actively go in that direction.
Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, we have to say again, it's a very complex problems and it's a lot of points we have to tackle. Um, and we have seen that Femtech provides some answers at least. So we had one question in the chat, um, which goes to all of you. Um, and it says, um, it, it was asked by Axel Karpenstein in Germany, and it uh, was uh, asked, what would you say is the one most important measure to, ta uh, to take to promote Femtech? I think in Germany and in Japan as well. I would like um, to ask you for a very short answer to this, um, but uh, just while you are thinking, uh, please let me address the audience. Uh, for the last 15 minutes, um, you're invited to ask some questions directly uh, by switching on your video and um, using your microphone. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and then I will call your name and um, you can switch your microphone on and talk to our speakers directly. But um, coming back to the question of Femtech promotion, Amina, may I start with you? How could we promote Femtech in Japan? The most important measures to take, so many ways to. The one, the one most important measure to take, yes. I think it's important for the promoters of Femtech companies to, to not assume that the uh, biologically defined men can understand what biologically we go through and they use the product to be able to have a conversation with it. Hmm. I use that a lot. I, in the beginning, I used to, to pack a lot of them that park in the back and go to banks and VCs and politicians and prime minister's office even. And I open up tampon and pads. And then I compare that with uh, um, um, uh, menstrual products, a new menstrual product, underwears and, and the cups. And then I told them, which one do you prefer? And then they never experienced uh, menstruation, of course, but they can tell, like, I prefer underwear. So just don't feel, you know, um, ashamed by it. It's, not, it's, it's okay to, it's basically to create an environment to be able to talk about these things, to use the product to, to promote and then to be able to have a conversation, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. Miyoko, could you add something for the Japanese side? What would be important to promote Femtech here in Japan? Yes, uh, uh, so in my opinion, uh, uh, we should share the merit of uh, diversity, the merit of uh, uh, participation, both of men and women. Oh, that is, uh, uh, most of the people know the merit of uh, diversity, but theoretically, but uh, they don't feel uh, by the action. So mm. uh, it is a very good idea to share the data of a merit of a diversity, so both be, uh, men and women's participation and others. So uh, we are not only men and women, uh, LGBTQ+, uh, many kind of people uh, are there in, in, in the world now, and we should share about it too. Yeah, thank you. So speaking about the merits of diversity, I think that's a very important point too. Karina, um, may I direct the question to you as well? How can we promote Femtech, in your case, I think, in the medical sector? Yeah, for me, it's also going back a bit to the question before, like uh, like improving the confidence of, of women. And I think we need structures, like structures in schools and universities and in institutions that really promote um, women and uh, diversity and I just can speak from my own experience, like uh, at the BIH, we have this um, Office for Gender Equality. And um, this is the first institution where we, where I experienced this um, intense support for women. And it really does something to you. It makes you more innovative and more confident. And also having like these role models of women that support you. Because I can also tell the difference, like, I had male bosses, I had female bosses and the female bosses, there's like so much advice and detail for your career um, that you can learn from to be more confident and to go out there. So this is like uh, my opinion on that. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Peggy, what would you say? What is necessary to, to promote Femtech in Germany? Uh, hard to add something after all that's been said already but i think i my wish maybe um is to kind of like normalize it because it's like femtech is nothing special i mean it's women's health and since women are half or even a little bit more than half of the world's population i think 
I really wish it would be normal. And um, I also wish for Femtech that it is more than reproductive health because like the female medicine side, it's also sometimes referred as bikini medicine because women were kind of like stripped down of their sexual parts. So it's about breast cancer and um, you know everything that's like down there, like urinary infection. We are much more. And we had those examples with ibuprofen and there are so many more. Um, this awareness that women needs are different than men's needs and in gender medicine also they're like both sides so in some cases also men are like not on top of the game because the medicine is like assuming the wrong facts so I think normalizing it and um, as has been said already like Karina said it it's like starting at a very very early age raising the awareness talking about those things in the chat there was this like beautiful book from uh, Caroline Perez mentioned Invisible Woman which has super many examples and some of them are just when I read it I was like really and when you think about it there are so many bias in our society so I think normalizing it making it like part of our daily routine starting to freely talk about it so that it's not something like like taboo topics, uh, not like femtech topic or menstrual cup topic. It's normal. It's like women, like different bodies. We can see that. And it's like from the brain to the toes. So I, that would be my wish. Yes, thank you very much. Last but not least, Nicola, what are your thoughts? How can we promote femtech even more? Thank you. <laughs> well, I think to promote it even more, I think uh, the, the solid business case and presenting the business case um, for, for femtech would be the way. And I hope that we use that as like sneak attacks then on the tech uh, sector as as a whole and so on the institutions and on the um, culture and um, then in the end everything is equality tech or however you would like want to call that <laughs> right thank you very much um I see right now no one from the audience is raising their hands so just again if you would like to address our speakers directly um, by asking a question, um, please feel free to do so. Um, your microphone and camera will then be enabled. But right now, I cannot see anyone raising their hand. So let me come back to one question we received in the chat. Um, there was the question um, if, let me just go back. Um, if femtech um, is also a topic in the food industry, uh, which goes back to smart agriculture. And I think this actually brings us also to the field of gendered innovations, because we said um, women are not only underrepresented in this field of medicine, but in a lot of fields. So um, Nicola, maybe I can give this question to you. Would you wish femtech to, to get even broader and also uh, include fields like ag agriculture as well? Right, from from that perspective, that would already be like the, the normalizing or the, the, you know, just kind of taking over that we're talking about, because of course, the, the agricultural um, sector, just like urban development or mobility, um, all areas where we're developing products, where we're developing technology, where digitization is taking, taking place, of course, should um, should consider that um, the different um, the different patterns that we have in different, let's say, intersectional groups. You know, I think here it's important to not only think about women or men, but all genders. To think about age, what we've been talking about. To think about um, also socioeconomic background. You know, um, both in the agriculture. You know, what can somebody afford? Is, is a relevant is a relevant point here and and all these factors um, need to be taken into consideration in the in the development processes that are taking place there so absolutely yes and that's that's really what um, gendered innovations is all about to really make sure that um, that methods um, that um, look at sex that you know in terms of biological factors gender in terms of um, societal factors and then intersectional analysis um, are used to create new knowledge to create um, practical methods of how to improve the situation um, for everybody thank you very much um Amina, if we maybe um, talk on a practical level, you are offering a marketplace for femtech products. So would it also be an option for you to include products which are not actually related to medicine or health, but let's say also um, 
the female crash test dummy or something like that? Or do you think um, Samsung should be yeah, more yes. specific? I guess for the B2C business, we're uh, providing, you know, so to say, a female um, a wellness product for, uh, for female women. But we also work B2B, big uh, corporate companies. And I can't disclose all the name, but you'd be surprised to see the list of uh, multinational Japanese companies, not just from the tech sector, but like food sector, drink sectors interested in entering into femtech. Um, sort of, they call it femtech, really? so women's mm. wellness industry. Um, from from this sort of perspective, they call it femtech project. There, it, there's not so much tech tech data aspect to it, but then I think there will be a huge potential, and I think. People started to, I mean, big corporates started to realize that there is a huge sort of blue, it's, it's a blue ocean, right? The market um, that has, hasn't been this addressed. So it's not just going to be a startup um, that going to be big. I think there is going to be a blowing uh, new sort of market uh, interest for big companies as well. That includes food industry. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, that's very inspiring to hear. So um, looking at the time, I think we have to come to an end. Questions are actually coming in right now in the chat. I'm sorry, we cannot address all of them. I saw there was one question um, about how the normalization could be expanded to a global scale. Maybe we could take that up for a last statement. I would actually like to ask you what you would wish for the future to happen um, in the femtech sector or also with regard to female empowerment. So um, in a perfect world, where would we be in 2025? Where would femtech be? And um, also, if we think about this question on a global scale, what um, developments would you wish for? If I could just um, ask you for a very brief statement in the end. Karina, maybe start with you. So I will start, uh, of course, again, with the data level. So my perfect future would be we have regulations where we're not even talking about was gender a topic or sociodemographic issues or ethnicity, but it's like really there. And I think, uh, for example, countries like Afghanistan, that's a good hint when we're thinking of all the data coming from wearables now, you know, in countries where like maybe women don't have the access to an iPhone or like a smartwatch. So that we're like also thinking about that. So yes, I want uh, the regulations and I want more role models and uh, women in leading positions. So we have all these questions being asked for us women and beyond, yeah. <laughs> or other minorities too, of course. Yes, thank you. Miyoko, could I ask you next, what would be 2025 in a perfect world? Okay, uh, so I hope uh, the technology will be for everybody, including men and women and LGBT people, and by everybody, including men and women and LGBT people. So the technology will be more uh, fruitful and uh, wonderful i think thank you very much yeah let's hope for that um peggy what are your thoughts what should happen in the future um i would my wish would be because women in itself are very very strong and i sometimes feel that we don't use the power because we don't talk openly about what's happening. So I see it in the field of menopause. So mothers don't talk about the symptoms, even friends. You know, when I started the company, there were a lot of my friends who were like, no, 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 I'm not in menopause. I still have my period. Um, it goes to pregnancy. We don't uh, talk about like, you know, after you gave birth. So women are always like, oh yeah, you know, it's all gloomy, shiny and everything's happy. So we should start talking about like, everything you know and because I think this openness this directness um, helps other women to have like to normalize their own body and then to feel more confident because I see in a lot of women there's a lack of confidence and I think like I wish confident women that they you know feel the power that they have inside them and I think then like you know boom <laughs> right yes <laughs> it's very motivating Nicola, what are your thoughts for 2025, <laughs> your wishes? Well, yeah, I just want to pick up where Peggy said, really, really speaking about it and talking about it. And I think all of us who are out in the open with this topic know this experience when other people come to us and say how important it is to really uh, look at this. So I think this empowerment is good. And I think it's good for us and for everybody to use it in terms of allyship. 
you know, so w women allyship with LGBTQ plus, um, of course, male allyship, you know, this really standing up for others, um, this really, um, if, we're, if we're looking at what we need, then of course, we also need a chance for um, for men to find new roles, to find their way into um, really being also responsible in their part for reproductive medicine, for example. I think there's a very close link to, to femtech there because we, we so much focus on that, but I think it's everything in terms of um, t taking care of, of, um, of children, of older people, the whole care issue. And once we have an, a fair distribution there and really a chance for everybody to make their choices um, freely and we have this allyship and the empowerment, the support. Um, I hope, like we all have said, um, that then Femtech is not no longer needed anymore. Thank you. I mean, I think you already told us about um, the term Femtech maybe uh, shouldn't be needed in a perfect world, but what are your thoughts about a perfect world? Yeah, and yeah, definitely that. And then also um, from my own private sector um, perspective, we will, I, I hope that Asia in a way lead, would be leading the movement of femtech in about five years or so. And, I, and the reason for that is I think femtech, as you say in the very beginning, you know, more than half of the companies are um, from the US and the rest are majorly from the from Europe. So the values, you know, like understanding bias, I mean, taboo it's pretty much um, dominated by the Western perspective. And I think in the Eastern part or where, you know, Asia, like Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, I think we culturally views taboo differently. And I guess because of the, it's not a bad thing, but with the recent West Westernization, we kind of, kind of forgot our roots, you know, how we used to see genders and sex. And so I guess hopefully this movement of femtech in Japan and Asia will remind us, you know, our, our sort of um, values and understanding towards this particular issues and come up with our own original answers and solution for it. Yes, thank you very much. That's also very inspiring. So looking at the time, I think we have to come to an end. Um, thank you very, very much for discussing. Um, it was a great pleasure. I'm even more interested in the topic now, I have to say, so many more questions. But um, yes, Phoebe, may I give back to you? <laughs> yes, of course. And well, thank you so very much, Laura, for moderating this very interesting discussion. And of course, a very warm thank you to all our speakers for taking your time for this great contributions to today's event. And also, we had a great audience from a broad range of fields. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your interest in the event and for taking part today and for your comments in the chat. Now, we invite every one of you to uh, take part in informal networking and Zoom breakout rooms for the next uh, about 30 minutes. Um, for those of you who wish to take part there, we will uh, now arrange the breakout rooms. We have a short break for up to um, three minutes, and then you will be automatically assigned to a breakout room together with a group of participants. And in each group, we will have an MC as an icebreaker. So you don't need to do anything. Uh, just stay with us. Please note that there will be no simultaneous interpretation service in the breakout room, and please note as well that this time um, the speakers need to withdraw and cannot take part in the general networking and we kindly ask for your understanding in this matter. But should you be wishing to contact one of the speakers directly, please write an email to info.dwih slash tokyo.org or connect with the speakers on LinkedIn. To all of you who do not wish to participate in the networking session, Thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon at DWIH and JDZB. Thank you, and well, the breakout sessions will start soon. Just bear with us, please. Thank you.